But I want to talk to you about bad girls. Now, this is in lieu of next week. And don't be surprised. Next week is Mother's Day. So I thought, why not talk about bad girls? Be appropriate. Uh, next week, maybe we'll talk about good girls. Um, but I do have a disclaimer. And part of this disclaimer, um, I'll try to illustrate. Um, when I was three-ish, I did something bad. I don't remember what it was. But I remember my mom calling out my name. And she used my middle name as well, which is always a bad thing. She said, Jess Gordon, where are you? <laughs> and uh, I saw her, I was in the living room, she was in the kitchen, and we met at the dining room table. And she was on the opposite side. So I just stood there, and then as she walked around, I started to run. <laughs> and then she would stop, and then she'd run the other way. So this kept going, and she starts laughing. Well, I'm in trouble, and she's laughing. And um, finally, she convinces me to stop. I'm not going to spank you. You've done something wrong, but I'm not going to spank you. I said, all right. So I, I stopped. And just as she got oh so close, her eyes changed. <laughs> and I took off. And so she chased me again. And then she convinced me one more time that I wasn't going to get spanked for what I did. And then when she finished spanking me, I realized this is a bad woman. <laughs> and um, she had a, and it was a pitiful spanking. It was one of the, wor the, the best, I guess it was best, because I really didn't feel much. But the guilt I had, it, was, it didn't leave my body, because she didn't hit me that hard. I think it was because she was still kind of chuckling and laughing about what I did running from her. So the disclaimer is that I'm going to talk about four women of the Old Testament and their badness, but what I'm going to, what I, the disclaimer is, the men made it possible. Uh, it was mostly the men's bad intentions that created the badness in these women. So the first one we're going to start with is Tamar. Um, Tamar, well, let's see. Yeah, Tamar was, was a woman, um, and I want to just say that, that what happened was, the, the storyline here is, then the background is, is Judah was her father-in-law. And Judah, he did something that he broke tradition. His father, or excuse me, his grandfather had chosen a wife. Abraham had chosen a wife for his son Isaac, who happened to be Rebecca. And this continued on. When it got to Judah, Judah fled or left his brothers and went to Ju uh, Ju Ju yeah. he went to Judah. He left Judah. Genesis chapter 8, verses 1 through 26. At that time, Judah left his brothers and went down to stay with a man in, of Adullam named Hurrah. There Judah met the daughter of a Canaanite man named Shua. He married her and made love to her. Now, before I continue... The Bible is not written in G, rated G. There's PG, there's some really beyond PG-13 and whatever. But I'm not going to make any excuses for what God breathed for us to see. So that's another disclaimer. And she became, okay. Uh, then Judah met the daughter of a Canaanite man named Shua. He married her and made love to her. She became pregnant and gave birth to a son whose name was Ur. She conceived again and gave birth to a son, and his name was Onan. She gave birth to still another son and named him Shelah. It was in Kezib that she gave birth to him. Now, this is where Judah continues the tradition that he skipped. Judah got a wife for Ur, his firstborn, and her name was Tamar. But Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the, of the in the Lord's sight, so the Lord put him to death. Then Judah said to Onan, "Sleep uh, with your brother's wife, and fulfill your duty to her as a brother-in-law. Raise up offspring of your brother." Now that's another tradition. If the oldest son dies and he's married, the widow then gets to be with the second son, if there is such a thing. 
And um, then he, when they had children, they would be the oldest sons. That was tradition. Um, sometimes traditions are good. I don't think that would be so good for us to continue that tradition. Um, and one thing that I forgot to leave out was when this tradition, I had dated um, for a couple years different girls or women, young women. And I would date one at a time. And when I realized that I wasn't supposed to marry this person, this woman, I would graciously get out of the relationship to move on because my goal was to find somebody that I was going to marry. Now, I went, I did this for a few years, and I finally went to my folks, and I said, please, I want you to be like Abraham and Sarah and find a wife for me. And uh, they agreed that they would do that. Well, a few weeks later, circumstances brought me to a young woman, and my folks didn't know who she was, but uh, I brought her home to introduce her to my folks. And after they met with her and she went home, they said, she's the one that we would have picked. And then later on, I met Renee. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it was Renee. Who they were. And they were very pleased with my choice. And then they took credit for it, which is fine. So anyway, as that, that tradition of... Uh, so Onan... Let's continue verse 9. It says, But Onan knew that the child would not be his. So whenever he slept with his brother's wife, he spilled his semen on the ground to keep from providing offspring to his brother. What he did was wicked in the Lord's sight, so the Lord put him to death also. Judah then said to his daughter-in-law, Tamar, Live as a widow in your father's household until my son Shelah grows up. After a long time, Judah's wife, the daughter of Shua, died. When Judah had recovered from his grief, he went up to Timnah to the, men, uh, to the men who were shearing his sheep, and, from, and his friend Hera, the Dolomite, went with him. When Tamar was told, your father-in-law is on his way to Timnah to shear his sheep, she took off her widow's clothes, covered herself with a well, Oh, excuse me, with a veil to disguise herself and then sat down at the entrance to Enam which is, in, which is on the road to Timnah for she saw that though Shela has, had now grown up she had not been given him to his wife now a footnote here Judah thought she was wicked she hasn't shown any kind of badness yet except that that both of his sons are dead and the only thing that was correlating the two was they were married or they were with her son or his sons were with her. So she, they, he thought she was wicked or cursed. When Ju Judah saw her, he thought she was a prostitute for she had covered her face. Not realizing that she was his daughter-in-law, he went over to her by the roadside and said, Come now, let me sleep with you. That's not a really good pickup line to me, but apparently it, it worked. And what will you give me to sleep with you, she asked. I'll send you a goat from my flock, he said. Will you give me something as a pledge until you send it? Uh, send, uh, until you send it, she asked. He said, what pledge should I give you? Your seal and its cord and the staff in your hand, she answered. So he gave them to her and slept with her, and she became pregnant by him. After she left, she took off her veil and put on her widow's clothes again. Meanwhile, Judah sent the young goat by his friend, the Dolomite, in order to get his pledge back from the woman. Now the pledge being his seal and its cord and his staff, those were identifiers. Those were his. Those had his, his name inscribed on them. They were they were recognizable that they were his. Um, kind of like a credit card with your picture on it, apparently. But it, the credit wasn't very good. Um, but he did not find her. He asked the men who lived there, where is the shrine prostitute who is beside the road at Enum? There hasn't been any shrine prostitute here. They said, so he went back to Judah and said, I didn't find her. Besides, the men who lived there said, there hasn't been an, any shrine prostitute here. Then Judah said, let her keep what she has. 
or we will become a laughing stock. After all, I did send her this young goat, but you didn't find her. So he tried to live up. He was kind of being a man about it. About three months later, Judah was told, your daughter-in-law, Tamar, is guilty of prostitution, and as a result, she is now pregnant. Judah said, bring her out and have her burned to death. Another tradition. This is where it gets really bad. You thought it was bad already? This is bad. As she was being brought out, she sent a message to her father-in-law, I am pregnant by the man who owns these, she said. And she added, see if you recognize whose seal and cord and staff these are. That's bad. <laughs> In a good way, that's bad. Judah recognized them and said, she is more righteous than I, since I wouldn't give her to my son, give her to my son Shayla, and he did not sleep with her again. Um, you know, I didn't realize this until I was uh, through with this first service. She never got payment. But she did get twins. She had twins. Um, but Judah here shows why he was more honorable than his older brothers. Because he said, she is more righteous than I. King David went through that same process and uh, God called him the man after his own heart. Judah was set apart because of that, um, because of his actions. Even though he made mistakes, he was still righteous. The second one, woman I want to talk about is Rahab. And Rahab is a prostitute. So the first lady dresses as a prostitute. The second one is a prostitute. Now, to catch up in history, this is where the children of Israel have already left Egypt. They go and they're going to conquer the land. So Moses sends out 12 spies. And some of you probably remember, 12 men went to spy out Canaan, 10 were bad and 2 were good. You know, some of you remember that song? You do? Good. Come on up and sing it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so anyway, what had happened was, uh, for, uh, because of their, the 10 said, we can't take them, they're too big, they're too ugly, uh, there's too many of them. We can't take him. And two of the spies said, hey, God can take anybody he wants. Let's go get him. The two men were Joshua, who we're going to read about, and Caleb. Caleb is actually a descendant of Judah through his line. Then Joshua, son of Nun, secretly sent out two spies to Sh from Shittim. Go look over the land, he said, especially Jericho. Ju or, excuse me, Joshua learned, his, learned a, a lesson. He didn't send out 12 spies. He sent out two spies because he remembers the last time it, that only the two had the right answer. Because of the 10, they spent 40 years out in the desert just walking around wandering and God was, was basically raising up a new nation. And he taught them to rely on them with the manna and so forth and rely on God only. And that's what he wanted them to understand. Now that they've spent the 40 years, they're going to go in. One of the biggest, baddest places that they were going to fight in was Jericho, which was a fortified city, had a wall, a huge wall around it. And that's where they were headed. So he sends out two spies. So they, they entered the house of a prostitute named Rahab and stayed there. The king of Jericho was told, look, some of the Israelites have come here tonight to spy out the land. So the king of Jericho sent this message to Rahab. Bring out the men who came to you and entered your house because they have come to spy out the whole land. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. She said, yes, the men came to me, but I do not know where they had come from. At dusk, when it was time to close the city gate, they, let, they left. I don't know which way they went. So she's a prostitute and she's a liar. She's a big liar. Um, that was a, the whole thing was a lie. Go after them quickly, <laughs> to add to the, the, the goodness of it all. Go after them quickly, you may catch up with them. But she had taken them up to the roof and hidden them under the stalks of flax she had laid out on the roof. So the men set out to, in pursuit of the spies on the road that leads to the fords of the Jordan. And as soon as the pursuers had gone out, the gate was shut. Before the spies lay down for the night, she went out 
on the roof and said to them, I know that the Lord has given you this land and that a great fear of you has fallen on us. So all of you who live in this country are melting in fear of you. You have heard, or excuse me, we have heard how, uh, how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt. How many years ago had this taken place? The Red Sea party and Moses going through, the Egyptian army, come on. 40, 40 years, yeah, 40 years. They've been in fear for 40 years knowing that God was gonna take them. That anticipation alone would, would give me the heebie-jeebies. But that, that's just crazy that, that she knows their history. She understands it. And what you did to Shion and Og, the two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan, were you completely, uh, were you completely destroyed. When you, we heard of it, our hearts melted in fear and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord your God is God in heaven and above and on the earth below. Now I'm gonna jump ahead a little bit um, of the story, but basically what happens is the two spies return. They give the report and um, Joshua, who's the leader now that Moses has died, Joshua says, uh, this is what the Lord tells us to do. For six days, we walk around Jericho. On the seventh day, we walk around it seven times. The priests will blow their trumpets. You guys scream as loud as you can, and the walls are going to fall. Now, God had just set them through the desert for 40 years and fed them and told them what to do and gave them that they were dependent on him. He could have told them, I want you to do three cartwheels and sing Amazing Grace, and the walls would have fell down. All he wanted was their obedience. Walking around was just, you'd be obedient. It sounds crazy that you're gonna scream and the walls are gonna fall down, but it was because God wanted them to be obedient. So let's, let's move ahead. They've already screamed, the walls come down. Uh, Joshua three, thank you, Jared. Joshua said to the two men who had spied out the land, go into the prostitute's house and bring her out with all her, uh, who belonged to her in accordance with the oath, your oath to her. So the young men who had done the spying went in and brought out Rahab, her father and mother, her brothers and sisters, all who belonged to her. They brought out the entire family and put them in a place outside of the camp. So, so far, let's recap. <laughs> We've got Tamar, dresses as a prostitute, sleeps with her father-in-law, and Rahab, who is a prostitute and a really good liar, those are two of our bad ones. Now we're going to go to Ruth. And I put a big question mark there because everybody thinks Ruth was such an innocent young woman. The book of Ruth tells of this beautiful love story between um, Ruth and Boaz. But to me, the real love story was between Ruth and Naomi. That was the, one of the greatest love stories, I think, in the Bible. I think one of the other ones is two men. Jonathan and David. That was another beautiful love story. The number one love story is God sending his son. That's the number one. But Ruth, how could she be a bad, bad girl? Let's read the introduction of Ruth. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. So a man from Bethlehem and Judah, together with his wife and his, and his two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. Typically, when uh, the Israelites had any kind of famine, typically they would go to Egypt because that was a land of lots of water and plentiful of food and everything. But for some reason, I think we know the answer when we get historically look at it, but for some reason, they go to Moab. Now, the, city, the, the country of Moab was, was a wicked country. Um, they... They were very perverse, um, and it, we'll read about what happens here, but I'm going to start with this, but they go to Moab. The man's name was Elimelech. His wife's name was Naomi, and his name of his two sons were Malon and Kilion. They were Ephraimites, Ephraites from Bethlehem, Judah, and they went to Moab and lived there. 
Now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpah and the other Ruth. After they had lived there about ten years, but Malon and Kilion also died, and Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. So again, what's bad about Ruth? Nothing I read there sounds bad, right? She's innocent of it. Her, husband's, uh, her husband dies, her father-in-law dies. What's bad about it? Let's jump ahead um, to verse 14. Um, what happens is uh, Naomi decides the famine's over. I don't need to live here. My people are in, back in uh, Bethlehem, so I need to go back there. But I don't need to take my two daughter-in-laws. And she gives this argument that I'm too old to have boys, more sons, for you. And if I, was, if I did, and it poss physically possibly could do this, you're going to wait till they grow up and get old enough for you to make, make them your husbands? No. So she says, I'm going to leave, and I want you to stay here. At this, they wept aloud. Then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Is that bad to cling? I mean, if you're not breathing, maybe, you know, that's a little tight. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or turn back from you. Where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. Still, is she bad? What's, where am I coming off with this bad part? Let's historically look at something here. When... When Sodom and Gomorrah were about to be destroyed, Abraham is, encounters these two messengers from God. He realizes they're angels, and he, he deal, deal, tries to deal with them to get them to say, you won't destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, because he knows his nephew Lot is parked there living in Sodom. So he says, uh, he, they go, and when they get there, when they get to Sodom, they find Lot and his family. When he finds their family, um, he's urging them to go. We got to go now. We got to go now. God is going to destroy this place. And Lot is supposed to take his wife, his two daughters, and his two son-in-laws because their daughters are married. The two son-in-laws wanted to have any part of it. Now they grew up there, and they they were part of that culture, the perverse culture that was there. They decided we're not going to go. For some reason, they had this burning desire to stay. That was a pun, for those who know the story. Sorry, you shouldn't even have to announce that it was a pun. I, sorry, that was bad. Um, so this is where we are. Um, as they're leaving the city, Lot is being uh, directed by the two angels. And they're going to take him to the mountains. But he, Lot says, I can't make it to the mountains. Can't we just go to neighboring Zor? That's where I, I think we should go to Zor. Well, the angels said, hey, uh, we'll spare Zor on your account. We'll take you there. So that day, there were supposed to be three cities that were to be destroyed. Sodom, Gomorrah, and Zor. Zor was spared because of Lot saying, I can't make it to the mountains. So that's where we are in the story. And the other part of the story is his wife died of a high sodium count. And I don't know what that was, that was about. She kind of looked over her shoulder and sodium overtook her. So this is where we pick it up in Genesis chapter 19. Lot and his two daughters left Zor and settled in the mountains for he was afraid to stay in Zor. Why was he afraid to stay in Zor? Because it was just like Sodom and Gomorrah and he knew what happened there. He didn't want to stick around and have his daughters hang out there either. So they go up to the mountains. He ends up in the mountains anyway. Uh, in Zora, he and his two daughters lived in a cave. One day, the older daughter said to the younger, Our father is old, and there's no man around here to give us children. 
as is in the custom all over the earth, let's get our father to drink wine. And this part is not a tradition or a custom. Let's get our father to drink wine and then sleep with him and preserve our family line through our father. That, that night, they got their father to drink wine and the older daughter went in and slept with him. He was not aware of it when she lay down or when she got up. And I'm gonna jump ahead to uh, verse 36. Basically what happens is the second night, the younger daughter, they do the same thing. They get him drunk and she sleeps with him again, or sleeps with him, the, the second daughter. Verse 36. So both of Lot's daughters became pregnant by their father. The older daughter had a son and his name was Moab. Or, yeah, Moab. He is the father of the Moabites of today. The younger daughter also had a son, and his name is Ben Amimi. And, in, and he is the father of the Ammonites. So the historical part is this valley, this area of Sodom and Gomorrah, the two daughters end up getting the father, uh, they get pregnant by their father. The youngest, or excuse me, the oldest one is Moab. So they take this land and become the Moabites because of it. That's where Ruth was. Above them was the Ammonites, and, and uh, they were north of them. But every time the Israelites had problems or went through Moab or sent messengers or whatever, the, Am or the Moabites were evil, wicked, and perverse. They continued the traditions of their forefathers, the ones that perished in the fire and brimstone. They continued that, that way of life. So the Moabites. So Ruth is a Moabite. So it's her past that makes her bad. We all have skeletons from family members, from where we grew up, from whatever, from who our neighbor was. Everything gives us, can give us a bad reputation. The Moabites had an extremely perverse and immoral reputation. God allowed them to beat up the Israelites once in a while and the Israelites handed it back to them as well. But that's where Ruth came from. So when I say Ruth was bad, it was her reputation of her people. When she made that choice, I will live with you, your people, and your God will be my God, that was a changing point because Ruth, all in her background of badness, she decided that to her, Naomi was attractive because of her God. She attracted Ruth to stay with her because she loved her God and she liked that lifestyle over what she'd lived in all her life. Let's look at another one. This is our third lady. So, so far we've got a daughter-in-law that sleeps with her father-in-law and she dresses as a prostitute. We have a prostitute, then we have a woman who had a bad reputation because of who she belonged to and where she grew up. Now we have Bathsheba. Now Bathsheba, this, you don't have to go back to it, Jared, but this is where the disclaimer comes in. It's the man. King David is the one that makes her fall. But in scripture, it doesn't say that she said, oh no, not me, leave me alone. She doesn't do, it doesn't share any of that. Um, but I'm gonna read the scripture anyway. In 2 Samuel, in the spring at the time when kings go off to war, apparently that's a good time to go to war, spring. So if you're afraid of an army coming, first of spring, start getting nervous. David sent Joab out with the king's men uh, and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites, the Ammonites, which was Lot's grandson's son, family, and besieged Reba, but David re remained in Jerusalem. This is very unusual. David was usually frontline general fighting. For some reason, he stayed at home and let them go do the fighting. So David is at home. This is his downfall. When, one evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful, and David sent someone to find out about her. She is Bathsheba, the daughter of Elam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Then David sent messengers to get her. She came to him and slept with him, with her. Does that make Bathsheba bad? She is a married woman. 
I mean, maybe she was just enamored because he's the king. I don't know. But she's, that's part of the bad that I'm, try, I'm looking for there. She went ahead and had a relationship with the, with the king, knowing that she's married. Now she was purifying herself from her monthly uncleanliness. Then she went back home. The woman conceived, sent word to David saying, I am pregnant. Now the rest of this story is, is all on David because David sends a message to, the, to Joab, who is his, one of his generals, Bring, send Uriah the Hittite back to me. And in this plan that he'd set out, was he was going to have him come back and he would spend time with his wife and surely she would get pregnant by him, even though she is already pregnant. But he wouldn't know the difference, right? So David sets out this plan. So he comes into the palace. Uriah comes to the palace. And David says, go on home. Well, in the morning they find him sleeping on the palace floor with the servants. And when asked about it, he said, how can I go to war, or go to war, how can I be, spend time with my wife when all my buddies are on the front line fighting? I, the guilt would be too great. So he didn't go. So David's like, okay, plan B, let's get him drunk. This is kind of a, a, a rolling story here. So he gets him drunk. I'll go back to your wife now. So in the morning, he, they wake up, and he's back on the palace floor asleep, sleeping with the slaves, the servants. And David's like, well, will you be a mail carrier for me? So David writes out a note to Joab, his general, and, and he wants Uriah the Hittite to deliver this letter. And the letter says, when the fighting gets fierce, have, jo, uh, have you, Uriah stand out in front and when the fighting gets really bad, have the rest of the soldiers back off. That's his death sentence right there. He delivered his own death sentence. When they have an encyclopedia, if you want to see a good soldier, it's Uriah. He was faithful to the, to the team of the army that uh, David had set up, not knowing that David had set him up to die. She's part of that. And you know what? It makes sense for Bathsheba that if he's dead... I can live in the palace. I can be with the king. So we have the good, the bad, and the family. So I'm going to jump into the New Testament. I'm, I usually teach Old Testament stuff, but I'm going to jump into the New Testament because it sheds light on the Old Testament. And it, opens, it opened my eyes. You see, Matthew, when he wrote the Gospel of Matthew, he wrote it from the, the vantage point or the, the, from the direction of, I'm going to relate this to the Jews, historically. And to relate something historically, you go through genealogy and you tell about your family. And you, and you go through that. Now, Matthew, I think, had, had some, um, what's a good word? He had a way of humiliating or, or humbling the Jews in the words that he writes. Now go ahead and stop me uh, if, if I'm reading this wrong. But it says, this is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham and Sarah were the father of Isaac. Isaac and Rebekah, the father of Jacob, or the parents of Jacob. Nobody stop me. That's not what it reads. Sarah is not mentioned. Rebekah is not mentioned. Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac, the father of Jacob. Jacob, the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. What? That bad woman is mentioned in our genealogy? How dare Matthew write that in there? Why would he mention her? She dressed as a prostitute. Yeah. Oh, yeah, she had twins. Hmm, okay. Perez, the father of Hezron, Hezron, the father of Ram, Ram, the father of Abinadab, 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 the father of Nashon, Nashon, the father of Salmon, Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was, what? That can't be right. Why has he got Rahab in there? He didn't mention Sarah. Rahab, this is the same prostitute. 
Let's continue. Boaz, the father of Obed, who is the mother of Ruth, the Ruth the Moabitess, the non-Jew? What? Those, those people kept fighting us and, and killing us. Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of King David. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. Now, she's not, Bathsheba's not mentioned by name, but we know it's Bathsheba. But I think he tried to put a little more guilt on the people, realizing who their family is. He's pointing out the bad in their family. And it goes through. There's no other woman mentioned except, wait, there's one more. The last woman that's mentioned in this genealogy happens to be a woman that's engaged to be married and somehow becomes pregnant. Not by her, her husband, or her husband to be. And Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary. And Mary was the mother of Jesus, who is called the Messiah. You see, we all have bad in us. There's bad in our past. There's, we've done bad things. We've got reputations because of other people that we don't, or just, we just happen to be in their family. But you see, Matthew is pointing out the badness because he wanted to show that through anything that was bad, he brought perfection. The perfection was Jesus, the Messiah. He can use anybody he wants. He can use our bad selves to do anything he wants. And I thought it was interesting just pointing out that the only women that are mentioned in this genealogy had a reputation. He doesn't mention the others. He only mentions the ones that really had a bad reputation. By actions of their own or by actions of their past. Are you bad? Do you have bad in you? I'd like to read what the difference is. Uh, you don't have to find it, Jared. It, it's in Ruth. This is one of the hardest scriptures I ever have to read publicly because I usually cry. I didn't to the first service or now, earlier. She says, don't urge me to leave you or turn back from you. This is Ruth. Where you go, I'm not going to be able to do it. I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God my God. See, that's the decision we have to make. Are we attracted to other Christians, to those that follow Christ? Do we, are we like, wow, that's something I want to be a part of? Or are we not doing that? But she recognized the good Naomi. And we need to recognize that even though we're bad and have done bad things, we can still find perfection.